So as I said in the newsletter um, in the bulletin, I'll, I'll be taking some vacation later this week, thanks be to God, um, which means I won't be with you next Sunday, which is not something for which I would give great thanks, but is a consequence of being out of town. Um, Ann and I are taking a little road trip through uh, south, the, the southeast Missouri Ozarks as we celebrate our 30th anniversary. Yeah. I mean, it's not exactly the anniversary trip we had imagined, okay, but there are no airplanes or cruise ships involved in this one, and these days that's a good thing. It's kind of astonishing, actually, for me to think that it's been 30 years since Ann and I stood before the altar at the cathedral downtown and began this journey together. I mean, I don't know what 30 years is supposed to feel like, Some of you will know that better than me. Um, But at least for me, it feels like both forever and the blink of an eye all at the same time. So an an anniversary like this, you know, one with a a zero at the end, is is a good time to reflect on your relationship's significance, most of which, most of that conversation will come over a, a bottle of wine and a lovely meal in a few days. But for me at least, here's sort of where the theological part of that reflection goes. From the start, for me, our marriage has been a way that I've gotten to experience the love of God. And that's grown and changed as our relationship has grown and changed. But from the start, our marriage has shown me God's love in ways that, you know, abstract theologizing just doesn't, doesn't cut. Finding love, I'd say, is finding God. Now, Ann and I did not mean to get married near the Feast of the Transfiguration. That never entered into the calculus, Um, but it's how it turned out. And that's what we're marking here this morning. Um, Transfiguration transferred from its date later this week. And like Jesus' parables that we've been hearing, you know, through this summer... The transfiguration story is one of those that we may have heard many times, but only begin to fathom, deceptively straightforward, and and at the same time layered with meaning. So to set the stage, got to rewind just a little bit to the sections of the gospel reading just before what we heard today. So back up a bit, and Jesus asks his friends, who do you say that I am? And I imagine there might have been some silence as the disciples waited for somebody to pipe up and get it wrong. And Peter, obligingly, you know, the kid who always puts his hand up first in class, he blurts out an answer that's really more true than he could begin to know. He says, you're the Messiah of God, the the one God has ordained to rule as viceroy, like God's representative on earth. And and that's right, actually. So with the right answer out there, but cloudy, Jesus takes the chance to flesh it out a little bit. Being Messiah does indeed mean bringing the kingdom of heaven to earth, Jesus says, but not the way you're thinking. It means first that he'll undergo great suffering and be rejected by the religious authorities and, and be killed and then on the third day be raised. Okay, well, that doesn't exactly clear things up, Jesus, and and this mystery just sort of hangs out there for a few days as the disciples try to wrap their minds around it, or maybe try to forget it. And then we come to today's reading, as Jesus takes his leadership team, Peter and James and John, takes them up the mountain to pray, and there something happens in that that thin place of connection between heaven and earth, Jesus' full glory shines forth, the the limitations of his humanity giving way to divine majesty. And he's talking with Moses and Elijah, the people in uh, Israel's history closest to being on a first-name basis with the Almighty, and and they're discussing what comes next. Next which is Jesus' departure, his exodus in Greek, 
which will happen through his death and resurrection and return to the Father. So Peter overhears this and sees all this and he thinks he knows what this means. That Jesus is on a par with these other two spiritual heroes. And if that's true, he thinks, well, they should mark the moment in prayer and worship. But then God breaks in <laughs> to say, actually, no, the message is bigger than that. And the terrifying presence of the Almighty envelops the disciples. And they fear for their lives, reasonably, because their tradition teaches them that people who have a direct encounter with God don't live to tell about it. But God's news for them is that they've already had a direct encounter with God. They've been seeing God and living to tell the tale for three years now. Because Jesus is not just a human friend of God like Moses or Elijah. Jesus is divine, God's own son. And not only will Peter and James and John survive seeing the face of God in Jesus, they'll live forever, inheriting his eternal victory over death. So, God says, listen to him. Okay. <laughs> well, in those three years with Jesus, what have the disciples experienced? The Jesus that they've known listens to them. He teaches. He heals. He feeds thousands. He casts out the demons that possess us. He holds us accountable when we fall short and then welcomes us back with open arms. And before long, those open arms will be nailed to a cross as Jesus dies to be the bridge between the limits of human life and life with God that never ends. In other words, I think what Jesus gives us is relationship. I mean, he shows up and gives himself away and prioritizes the relationship with God and with us ahead of his own interests. So to be divine, to be the son of God, is to love. And in him, God has shown the disciples and shown us what that love looks like. Not thunder and lightning or fire and smoke, but a normal human face. That's how divinity is revealed. As the, the musical Les Mis puts it, to love another person is to see the face of God. Okay, well, that's great when you're on the mountain with Jesus, or maybe when you're celebrating your 30th anniversary over a bottle of wine and a perfect filet, you know. It's all well and good when your relationship's working well. Of course, for Ann and me, there have been times when things didn't work so well. Just, just like every other marriage on the planet, we've had times when we have managed to disfigure the divine image in ourselves and in our relationship. But we also managed to put it back together, the scars becoming part of love's portrait. And ironically, even with damaged and re-stitched skin, the face of God can shine even more brightly. And that same thing can be true with that friend who turned on you inexplicably, or the uncle you can't stand, or the person in your office who pushes your buttons, or even the person at church who sees everything differently than you do. It's all about making the choice to turn, and specifically the choice to turn toward rather than turning away. And we see that, I think, in today's Old Testament reading, though it's a little hard to see because it's a little dense. The, the chapters in the chapters leading up to this story and in today's reading itself, the story keeps hitting this theme of turning and returning. And those words come up uh, at least six times in those chapters. So before today's reading, 
Moses has put his own credibility on the line for the wayward people of Israel, people who honestly didn't deserve for Moses to stand up for them. Because when he went up Mount Sinai to receive God's law, the people decided he wasn't coming back and turned away from him and from God and started worshiping a golden calf and having quite a party. And in that moment, God wanted to wipe out the people then and there. But Moses intervened. He talked God out of it and, and returned to the camp and destroyed the idol and stopped the party. But he also asked God to forgive the people. At first, God wasn't having any of it and told Moses that, nope, they're on their own as they headed off to the promised land. But Moses interceded again. Remarkably, God changed God's mind, and Moses went back up the mountain. There, he got to witness God's glory in person, watching the Almighty pass by and greet him and receiving God's law a second time. So that brings us, finally, to today's reading. When Moses comes back down from being with God, and he scares the living daylights out of the people as his face glows with the glory of God's presence. Plus, you know, think about the subtext. The relationship between Moses and the people is in a bit of a rough patch, shall we say. Because when they had turned away from Moses and from God, Moses had killed those who took part in the uprising. But the people returned to Moses because he had turned back to them, despite the golden calf, despite God wanting to wipe out those stiff-necked people who'd rejected Moses' leadership. So think about that if you're Moses. I mean, wouldn't you imagine turning back to them was the last thing Moses wanted to do? It would have been a lot easier for him to take God up on the offer to destroy the disobedient Israelites and start all over again with him. It would always be easier to write off the people who, dis who disagree with us and turn away from us. It's, it's always easier to think, not only do I not need the headache of trying to deal with you, I don't need you at all. Now, you and I may not have had a transfiguration moment, you know. We might not have encountered the living God in some mountaintop experience. But we encounter the living God in person after person, day after day. And every day, we have to decide what we'll do when that experience goes south. Because it will. <laughs> this is where the where the rubber meets the road for a theology of incarnation, uh, Christianity's crazy claim that God took flesh and takes flesh still. I mean, if that's true, we got to ask ourselves some hard questions about our hardest relationships. So, let's ask. Who's turned away from you? From whom have you turned away. You know, look into that opponent's face and look for the face of God. Even when you want to turn away, choose instead to turn toward. I mean, Jesus himself gives the example. I mean, after all, even though Peter affirmed Jesus to be the Messiah, God's anointed king, Jesus knew that Peter would later turn away from him and deny him three times to save his own skin. But still, Jesus invites Peter to join him on the mountaintop. Thank God, Jesus extends the same courtesy to us. Our relational challenges, our relational failures, thank God, they don't define us. Instead, what does define us is that call to keep turning toward the troublesome other, assured that in another broken person, 
we will see the face of God. 